Hi, this is Julian for Production Expert. I love ProQ3 from FabFilter. It's super, super flexible and does loads of brilliant things. Uh, but there's an aspect of it that's kind of talked about less often, and that's because it's a bit difficult. Uh, I've got here a, a drum recording, which uh, I was setting up the other day. And it's, it's very simple, uh, very open. I've, there's quite a few options here I haven't I haven't used because, I mean, these, these cymbals and uh, these toms aren't even played, but I've still got some options in here. For example, I've got uh, these overheads, but I've also got this room mic, and uh, actually I've also got this pair here. Which I'm not even using, but even with this minimal set of mics together, I've got quite a bit of bleed between the different microphones. And uh, as you do, I was going, okay, this, it sounds good, but there's a couple of tweaks I'd like to make. And the natural first response is to go, for example, on this kick drum. Plenty of bottom end in there, but I thought, actually, I'd like to bring in a little bit more focus uh, towards the top of that, uh, well, the, the low mids. It's kind of subtle, but around 300 hertz, a little bit of a, a boost there, was working for me. Same goes for this uh, top snare, which was fine, but uh, in the mid-range, maybe. Just taking a little bit out around uh, 850 was working. Again, not a huge change. Also on the uh, on these overheads, was it on the overheads? No, it was on the on the room, actually. It was a little dark. So I thought maybe just bring out a little bit of top end with a high shelf. Not huge changes there. But the thing that I've done by doing that, and this is what most of us do, I think, is to go, okay, I want to do something to kick. So you go to the kick channel. I want to do something to the snare. I go to the snare channel. But all of these things are interrelated and all of those mics are receiving bleed from each other. And it's not always the right thing to do to cut that stuff out. But by EQing them separately, you're affecting the spill. You're affecting everything. Everything's affecting everything else. So here we are. And uh, if I bypass them all, and we'll just pop that in, we'll hear the difference. Relatively subtle. Actually, I mean, maybe, maybe more subtle than it should be. Wouldn't it make more sense not to EQ those individual source tracks, but instead, because they're all one instrument, just to EQ all of them together? This is the same moves, this 3 dB shelf, 3 dB cut at 850, and a 300 hertz boost across the, uh, the bus on this routing folder. And actually, this is going to work better compared to Now, part of the reason for that is because it's uh, it's affecting everything because there's other routes that the sound of that kick drum or that snare drum can reach your ears other than just on the close mic because of the spill that we were talking about earlier. So, this is a good way to go. However, that brought me on to another aspect of this thing, which is that when we EQ we're not just affecting the level of the signals, we're also affecting the phase. Now, Pro-Q3 has this bit down here that lots of us don't pay a great deal of attention to. We've got zero latency, natural phase, and linear phase settings. Now, the, the practical difference this makes when you're using it is that if you're using particularly linear phase, you'll introduce some latency because that has to happen uh, to correct that phase. But most people will just go, well, for linear phase, you might use that uh, for mastering and leave it at that. Why? Well, the reason for that is because when you're changing the level of these different frequencies, you're also changing when they happen. You're affecting them in the time domain. I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so here I've got a pair of duplicate tracks. They're acoustic guitar tracks, and uh, they've got two trims on. One is polarity inverted, so when I hit play, we get nothing. Great. So I've got some Pro Q3s on here. They've got exactly the same filter set up. High pass filter at 80 hertz, 18 dB per octave. These are running zero latency. So if I unbypass them and play, we get nothing because they, they, they null against each other, as you'd expect. In the same way, I've got a pair here. And these, it's getting messy. I'll open that again. 
So we've got that one and that one. And these are exactly the same, but they're linear phase. And if I unbypass these, we still get nothing. But if we're running the same filter, if I bypass that one, come back onto here, and bypass that one, what's going on there? So here, we've got zero latency. On here, we've got linear phase, but they're the same filter shape, but they're not nulling against each other. The reason for that is because it's not because of the time difference because of plug-in latency, because I've got exactly the same plugins on both channels. It's because of the phase difference between the two. One is linear phase, leaves the phase alone. The other one, the low latency one, causes a phase shift within that signal. And we're hearing it. This is what happens when you have multiple paths through multiple EQs, which is why it's probably a good idea if you're EQing a group of instruments to do it at the summing point, unless there's a specific reason for you not to do so. Like, for example, you want to EQ a ring out of the snare drum, but you don't want to affect that frequency on the kick, for example. So yeah, these things, they can be quite minimal differences, but they do make a difference, and it's worth thinking about. This is why, most of the time, the default on an EQ that offers zero phase is with that zero phase switched off because it still incurs latency, and the gains are usually marginal, unless it's a complex signal that you don't want to get coloured by this phase shift.